So Jack, good afternoon. It's been uh, probably three months since we first met. And again, you know, uh, that was a great honor to meet you then, but it truly is an honor to, uh, to have this opportunity to spend time with you and especially to ask you some questions on behalf of all of the team at Skillsoft. I think, Jack, you don't need any introduction from me. You know, you're one of the most influential and respected leaders, business leaders oh, yeah, nice in the to world. Say that. And you know, I, when I think about you, Jack, I think there are very few people that you could describe as a rock star in business. <laughs> but I really do think about you as a rock star in business. And I've, I've spoken to lots of people, and you know, most people say you could count the number of rock stars in business maybe on one hand, and you're certainly one of them. And when I ask people, your name comes up all the time. You know, your accomplishments at GE have been legendary. And when you think about you know, the big companies today in the world, the big technology companies, the most valuable companies in the world, Google, Apple, those sorts of organizations, you really set the benchmark for the world's most valuable company, not just in terms of its own value, but in terms of your leadership, the culture you created there. And I know that um, the sage of Omaha, um, Warren Buffett described your book, the, the book Winning, as the only business book that you really need to read. So with that, I'm gonna ask you a few questions, if that's okay. Thanks, Bill, thanks for having me here today. Um, Jack, when we met, I realized then that you're really passionate about the Welsh Way and really passionate about the Institute and your students and what you're doing. Can you tell us a bit more about that and why you're doing it? Bill, I've been involved in education all my life in business. I spent uh, a day a month at Crotonville, our educational center at GE when I was there. I'm in pri private equity for the last 15 years with 74 companies ranging from as low as $200 million in, in re revenues to $20 billion. And so I've had experience across a lot of these bi businesses. And there's nothing like winning and getting people engaged and seeing people light up and seeing them grow. Watching a team grow and change their lives is what this is all about. What these programs do, the Welch Way, is give people a sense of purpose, give them a sense of satisfaction, teach them how to be great leaders, how they can grow their people. The, the challenge of leadership is all about how many people have you made better because you've been there and touched them. And that's what these Welch Way programs are aimed at doing in a small company, to a medium-sized company, to a larger company. Size makes no difference. How you engage with your teams and make them winners, make them the place to be. So tell me, where did you get this love of learning from? Where did it come from? I'm just curious about by nature. But what I really love doing is seeing people grow. I mean, I got my, if you will, little pile of money pretty early in my life. So for the last 40 years, I've been watching other people's piles grow. Right. And that is so good. Whether they buy second homes, whether they're free to quit when they want or do what they want. When they are having exciting jobs, where their job is the place to be, where they don't wake up, oh Jesus, I gotta go in again. No, where they, they hate Sandy coming because they're dying to get more done because their teams are turned on. They're, they're celebrating all the time. They're partying with success. All these things, Bill, business is a game. It's no different than a sport. The team with the best players wins. And you, this is a way in the Welch Way courses teach people how to get the best team in place, how to make them work as a team, and how to grow. And growth is like an elixir. Without growth, you got nothing. Jack, I, I read this quote from you. Before you become a leader, success is about growing yourself. And when you become a leader, success is about growing others. And you say, and I've, I've seen you quoted in several different places, that you say that some of your best business decisions were about promoting other people. Talk to me about, about that, about promoting people. You should celebrate your friend's promotion. It's all part of a, what I call a generosity gene where people are excited to give raises, where they're excited to help people grow, where they're, where they're turned on and they always have their people's back. And the success of their people 
is key to their own lives. Like I always ask recruits when I, when I uh, meet somebody from the outside for a promotion uh, that I'm hiring from the outside, I always ask them, how many people have you promoted in the last year? Tell me about your best five success stories. That's what you want to know. How many people have they made winners? We teach that in Welch Way courses. Relish others' success. Um, I know how important candor is to you, um, and especially in the workplace. It's really important to me. I sometimes think when I um, uh, talk in the business, occasionally people say to me that I um, am sometimes too honest. But actually, sometimes I think people want you to be honest about everything that's going on in an organization. You'll know that we're going through some change at Skillsoft. So why is Cando important to you? And, and what, what advice can you give, give us about Cando and why it's important uh, for Skillsoft? Cando is really transparency. It's opening up the kimono. It's getting to look at how the business really works. When you have candor, you get in a meeting and you lay the cards on the table. Everyone has the same facts. When everybody has the same facts, Bill, they generally come to pretty much the same conclusion. Sure. The problem is they don't get the same facts. They get spin and this and business ease and all that stuff. So what candor does, it creates enormous speed in an organization. Speed is the elixir for winning. And if you've got speed and you're moving quickly and making rapid decisions because you've got all the facts out there, you've got a better organization. You've got a healthier organization. So candor leads to speed. Simplicity leads right. to speed. Right. You want speed. In today's world in particular, now, GE 30 years ago, speed was less critical than it is today. Today, you've got to be faster than ever, and we talk about this all the time. You talk about winning a lot, um, and I wanted to understand what winning means to you. And if you think about particularly the people at Skillsoft who are out in the field, you know, their job, we're, we're all here to win, but their job is about winning every day. What advice can you give them about winning and why it's so important? Well, when you get up every day and you go in and fight the battle, winning changes the whole spirit. Let's take the locker room after a World Series or a soccer game. Do you want to be in the loser's locker room with a towel draped around your head? Or do you want to be popping the champagne cork? Where would you rather hang out? It's just a whole different spirit. When you win, you can give back. When you win, you can control more of your own personal destiny. So you want to be a winner because when you're a winner, your job security goes up exponentially. Your flexibility in the organization goes up exponentially. And you then control your own destiny. And as a winner, you, want, you can bring along other winners. Winning is a great thing. It's fun. Look, work is fun. If you don't make work fun, if you don't make it a game, you're missing a big part of your life because you're spending most of your waking time plugging away. However, if you're winning, it's not, doesn't feel like plugging away. It's exhilarating. What do you think the common behaviors of win winners are? Uh, positive energy. Uh, Excited and curious, love the fray. Like, I mean, you go to an account, for example, and somebody else is selling something there at, the, at, at that account. Damn it, you want to win. You want to get that account. And what happens when you get that account? You have a party, you celebrate, you bring the team together that helped you get the account. Look, celebrating is the most underrated management tool in the world. When You've got to find the littlest things to celebrate, recognize, take care of people. Don't get involved in what the company is doing. Get involved what you can change. You've got a unit. This woman has 62 people we're working for, a good-sized unit. She's been there 25 years. I said, 
Don't be bitching at the water cooler about your boss and the boss's boss. Take those 62 people and get results there that blow the world apart, where everyone's coming over to see your, how is Dorothy doing that? She's getting 62 people all turned on, all winning. The results are fantastic. They all come to you as the role model. Right. That's what you want. So do what you control. Don't go in and work and say, oh, Jesus, man. the CEO's a jerk, or the other guy's a jerk. And if they only knew what, do what you can fix, but make your place the place to be. Make your organization the hot spot where everyone's saying, I want to work for Dorothy. I want to be there. You, uh, you mentioned HR, and you'll know that a lot of our clients are mainly uh, HR people. Yep. So you talk about the importance of the HR person in the, in the organization. I think you've talked about this role of the parson and the parent. Can yeah. you explain that to us? Yeah, I, I really believe that if you really believe that the winners are the people who bet with the best teams on the field and make them operate as a team, HR, in my view, was always the number one function. More important than finance, anybody can add the numbers up. Anybody can do all that stuff. But I wanted people who would tell it straight as HR people and could be trusted with the people. For example, every HR person I ever had was a pastor, I would call them pastor and parent. As a pastor, they would keep secrets. They would let the people tell them why I was a jerk or why I was doing something wrong, but they would flush it out with them. But then they wouldn't come in and say, Jack, I want you to know that Billy over there is doing bad things. They would build confidence with the people so that people would come to them and trust them. Right. That's the pastor side of it. The parent side of it is you get a kick in the ass when you're off base. And that person does it quietly, but they lay it on as a parent. But I'll tell you, a pastor keeps confidences, guides people, and a parent tells it straight. And that's what great HR people do. They build that one word, T-R-U-S-T, -T, trust, with the people, not with me. I don't want them kissing my butt. I want them taking care of those people and those people can come and talk to them in confidence. When I speak to our clients, they uh, talk to me about two big challenges they've got right now. Everybody, of course, is concerned about making money and all those important things that they, they all care about. But the two things that are uppermost in their mind are retaining the people they've got and attracting new people to their organizations. What, what advice can you give them, Jack? Make your place the place to be. Grow. You've got to have growth. I mean, do you think Google's having tr tr trouble hiring people? Everybody, G never had trouble when I was there. Uh, the smaller companies we, I'm, I'm working with now who are turning people on have no trouble. If you, you've got to make your place the place to be. Now, the stock helps. The stock market's a big deal. Uh, the atmosphere, polling about is it a good place to work? is a big deal, whether it be Glassdoor or whatever. People are looking at that stuff. And you've got to make your place, Jesus, what a great place to work. Now, I know all the flaws of Glassdoor, and I know you get the complainers and that. But generally speaking, you need reputation. Sure. So, Bill, it's the challenge of the CEO and the t leadership team to create an atmosphere of excitement. And remember, Business is a game. Games are fun. Winners are better than losers. That's all it's about. It's not a complicated thing. It's human nature. That's great advice. Um, the other thing they talk about is this millennial generation. Um, what, what are your own thoughts on managing? So everybody says these millennials have very different expectations to everybody else. And we've got a, another generation called Generation Z coming behind them. What are your thoughts on dealing with their expectations? I don't think they're that much different than anybody else. It, it may not be a popular phrase to say. They got their nose against the glass. They want an atmosphere where 
truth is truth and trust are out there where people give them transparency where they don't have this covered glass if you will where where the air blows through where it's a meritocracy where they see rationale for everything they want things explained to them this is why we made this move this is why billy got promoted and mary didn't or well, mary got promoted and billy didn't they want to know transparency. I used to love, I used to love it more than anything in these companies I have. Letting people know everything. There are no secrets. When you run a company with no secrets, it's nothing but fun. But when you have these secret cabals, the, the, uh, the water cooler is filled with people trying to get around it to gossip. Gossip is a sin. You want the thing open. Nobody can gossip because they, that, here's, here's what the facts are. Here's why we did this. Here's why we bought this company. Here's why we didn't do this. And we screwed up here. Right. And we got this one right. Look, you don't make them all right. But you tell everybody you made it. I used to, when, when, when I made, made an acquisition of Kidder Peabody that turned out to be all investment bank that turned out wrong, I used to go to the education place all the time. I said, if I can screw this up this badly and be in the front page of the Wall Street Journal every week for being a jackass, you should be taking chances. I mean, that's the way it is. But no secrets. You talk a lot about work-life balance and the fact that you have to earn it. Can you explain to us what you mean by that? I think there are two things about Earth like work-life balance. I don't think there's such a thing as work-life balance. I think there are work-life choices. You make choices, and choices have consequences. Like, for example, you don't want to you want to work remotely. Okay, you're not there all the time when there's a fire drill and the guy is going. You might not be the first person they think of when the promotion comes. But okay, you got a lifestyle that works. We have a lot of remote pe people in our business. They're just not probably going to be mentioned, attracted at the same moment. Now, that's not in the end of all thinking. That's just reality. Sure. When you're in the face, in the trench, the bullets are flying, and you're not there. When the opportunities come, I talk about uh, work-life balance earning you chits because you were there doing all kinds of stuff. The company could count on you. You get chits in the bank. So that when you want to take some extra time, go somewhere, do something, fulfill a dream, whatever, the company says, I need you. Sure. You've made all those chits. You're in the bank. I'll take care of you. Take the time. You, you also talk about the rewards of the wallet and the soul. Yeah. T tell me about what you mean by that. Some, some companies love to give plaques. Every time I see a plaque, I want to throw it in the ocean. <laughs> Look, plaques are good recognition, and, and that's a reward in the soul. But I want two rewards, one in the wallet and one in the soul. So when I do some, something great or I see people doing something great, I, I want to make a meaningful financial contribution right. to that right. as well as a plaque. Fine. And, and I don't mean to demean plaques, but plaques by themselves just don't do it. Jack, I know how important uh, learning and teaching is to you, but I, I know equally giving back is also important. T tell me a little bit about giving back and why it's so important. Well, I think, you know, the best thing one can do if they've been lucky enough to come from nothing to a good job and a good life is to find ways to give back. Now, I have scholarships everywhere for kids that were in the spot I was in that didn't have scholarships. But, but that's part of it. But the most important thing I do is my school. I love this Jack Welch Management Institute. We're now up to 1,400 students. We, uh, 1,400 MBAs in five years. We uh, had our first graduation uh, last June in Washington on the mall. And we had, we've now had 500 grad graduates, but we had uh, 900 people there. And they came across the stage and I was giving out the diplomas. 
And it started slowly where a guy would say, I'd say congratulations, and he'd say, two promotions since I've been here. Then they started a, a rumble. And the H1 came across and said, 30% raises since I've been here. Uh, four promotions. Incredible stories of success. The stories of success in our school are the most, so I could have flown back without a plane. I mean, of all the things that I have ever done in my life, this education thing with our school and the resultant teaching people how to lead and build great teams dwarfs anything I've ever done. It's the most exciting thing I've ever touched. Well, Jack, hearing you say that reminds me of what a great privilege it is for Skillsoft to be working with you on this program. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you, Bill. Thank you so much. I, I, I love the program, and I love the partnership. Thank you.